His 15-hour filibuster on the Senate floor made him a household name and reinvigorated the push for gun control. Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy, he's here to discuss that and more. Then we will look at the presidential race and how both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are trying to overcome some new controversies as well as some issues. Also, our conversation with Democratic con congressional candidate Zephyr Teachout. She a rising star who's trying to make a seat here and take one that's now sitting in Republican hands. Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. Congress on recess, but Democrats pushing their constituents to protest gun control in their home cities. Now, the renewed push to do something about guns could very well have started with Senator Chris Murphy's emotional filibuster. Here, a part of it. I want to introduce you to Dylan Christopher Jack Hockley, who in this picture is age six. Dylan was struggling with autism as a student at Sandy Hook Elementary School. But he was a special, special boy who is going to turn in to a special, special young man. He idolized his brother Jake, but he idolized someone else as well. He idolized a woman named Anne Marie Murphy. Anne Marie Murphy was his special education teacher and his personal aide. When Adam Lanza walked into that classroom and aimed his military style assault weapon with clips attached to it holding 30 bullets, Anne Marie Murphy probably had a chance to run or to hide or to panic. And instead, Anne Marie Murphy made the most courageous decision that any of us could imagine. Instead of running, instead of hiding, instead of panicking, Anne Marie Murphy found Dylan Hockley and embraced him. You know why we know that? Because when the police entered the classroom, that's how they found Dylan Hockley. We spoke with Senator Murphy earlier today. We discussed guns, also how even the Zika virus is now politically polarizing. Okay, when your constituents ask you, what exactly does Planned Parenthood have to do with fighting Zika and why can't we get the funding out of Washington to deal with that airborne virus, what do you tell them? Well, you know, we had a compromise in the Senate, uh, $1.1 billion, less than the president wanted, but enough to get started on the Zika response. Unfortunately, the House of Representatives attached a whole bunch of political riders to the bill, familiar ones, cutting funding from the Affordable Care Act, preventing funding from going to Planned Parenthood, uh, that have made the bill a political football. And it's really um, something that my constituents in Connecticut don't understand because they've heard all about the Zika virus. They've seen the picture of these babies that are born with this awful birth defect microcephaly. We know now in Connecticut that we have at least three pregnant women that have contracted Zika. It's a public health crisis that's on top of us right now. And it's unbelievable that we're playing politics with it. It's unbelievable that the Republicans in Congress would, you know, try to hold this bill hostage to their political goals of killing the Affordable Care Act or defunding Planned Parenthood. I mean, the reality actually is that Planned Parenthood does have something to do with responding to Zika because one of the ways that Zika is transmitted is through, uh, is through intercourse. And so uh, contraception and uh, reproductive health care, that's an important element of trying to stop the spread spread of Zika. So we just need a clean funding bill. Just give the president and the administration what they need to fight Zika. Don't attach anything else to it. And let's go about the business of trying to stop Zika before it becomes a real epidemic. You, I know you know this, but this is uh, exhibit A, why so many people uh, when, are just so frustrated with Washington. I mean, this just seems so counterintuitive to just what the basic answer is to a real issue. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it's, it's, to most people that I represent, you know, they're so sick and tired of everything becoming a fight in Washington, everything becoming so hyper-political. You know, there's nothing political about mosquitoes that are carrying Zika, mosquitoes that are here in Connecticut. There's nothing political about babies being born with massive birth defects. That 
affects Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives. So just do the simple thing. Just say this is a public health crisis and we're going to put the money to beat Zika. We did it on Ebola. We put $4 billion into beating Ebola and we didn't get more than about four or five cases in the United States. So do the same thing here and you will uh, first address a massive public health crisis and second, you know, maybe restore people's faith that Republicans and Democrats can come together on something like this. Well, let me talk about another issue where there isn't uh, uh, unity by any means in Washington, the subject of guns. Uh, in fact, I spoke to uh, the parent whose picture uh, you held up at the end of that filibuster, and she, like many people, were moved. Um, but unfortunately, the best we could get was a vote in Washington and nothing more. Do you see incremental change um, it, about the possibility of some meaningful uh, change, reflecting what the public wants if you believe the polls, or do you think that it's going to be the same story, if not Newtown, not Orlando, there'll be another tragedy, we'll have another conversation, but very little in the way, in the national level at least, of meaningful reform? Well, I unfortunately think it's going to be the, the same story for the time being. We tried everything to get this bill passed that would stop people on the terrorist watch list from getting guns, and we just we just couldn't do it. We got, in the end, about eight Republicans to break from the NRA, but that wasn't enough. And, you know, the only place where this issue is controversial is in the United States Congress. You know, a poll after poll tells you that 90% of Americans think that you should have to pass a background check before you buy a gun, and on the list of people people who shouldn't buy a gun should be people who are on the terrorist watch list. I mean, it's just, it's really wild that 90% of the American public believe in those things and Congress can't get it done. And, you know, this is, issue is personal to me. You know, you spoke to Nicole Hockley and Nicole and Ian, Dylan's parents, you know, are close friends of mine. All those families from Sandy Hook, they're the same age as me. We all have young kids. And so, you know, I, I you know, did that filibuster on the Senate floor because I thought that it could move the issue forward, but also because, you know, psychologically, emotionally, I couldn't stand down and do nothing in the face of Orlando. Uh, I had to do something to show those families in Sandy Hook that I'm trying, despite the odds, to get something done to make these kind of mass shootings less likely in the future. Senator, there's only one thing, and obviously I understand the power of the NRA, I understand how intractable this, the issue can be, but what I don't understand is 90% of Americans can't agree if the sun's up, let alone agree on an issue, but right. they want background checks. I think the number's even higher for who in their right mind would fight to keep terrorists on no-fly list to be able to purchase guns. Is there really exposure politically to Republicans if they vote on both of those cases with the vast majority of the American public? Or is that just the perception not borne out in reality? Are these guys going to get primaried if they vote just on those two issues the way you would? I think you've hit the nail on the head. No, there is no political um, downside for Republicans. There's no political risk in supporting where 90 percent of the American public are. But, you know, they haven't exercised this muscle in 30 years uh, coming after the gun lobby and voting contrary to the NRA. So it's going to take some getting used to that it's okay that you can vote on these things and not get in trouble with the Republican base. Because what we know about this issue of stopping terrorists from getting guns is that it's uh, an issue that actually Republicans feel more strongly about than Democrats. And gun owners poll on the issue of background checks sometimes higher than non-gun owners because it's actually the gun owners that are the most responsible, that are most concerned with making sure that it's only law-abiding citizens that get guns. So there's no political liability for Republicans, but they you know, haven't figured that out yet. Well, Senator, I really appreciate uh, not only the time, but I, I know a lot of people on both sides of the aisle, by the way, who appreciated what you did on the floor of the Senate, along with a lot of your colleagues as well. Um, good luck uh, on the Zika funding and, and good luck on the fight as it relates to some uh, rational uh, gun legislation. Thanks again. Well, thanks a lot for having me. All right, coming up next, we will shift to some presidential politics and we'll take a look at the latest problem for the Clintons and another one, arguably, of their own making. But they have company. That is the Donald just made more headlines, believe it or not, for all the wrong reasons.